magic record button we'll start up um well hello everyone and thank you for joining us my name is patrick masson i am the executive director of the aperio foundation and this is our november micro conference our micro conferences started almost two years ago now um, as part of a, an aperio board strategy uh, discussion and we reached out to several folks in um, working in open source and, and education uh, to sort of get a picture of the landscape and understand some of the themes and topics that were uh, most impacting higher education and open source projects. And during those conversations, we realized, wow, these discussions are really great. We should open them up for the entire community. Um, and that started, like I said, almost two years ago. And um, they've really grown into um, a popular monthly event. Um, and so thank you for joining us here today and perhaps previously, and I hope to see you again. Uh, just some real quick uh, housekeeping before I do the introductions. Um, I think I would be professionally negligent if I did not uh, remind folks that we have our membership campaign, the Friends of Aperio, uh, going on right now. Um, we'll be talking a bit about uh, sustainability and community engagement. And, and this is one way that we hope that uh, we can work with our um, community to uh, help the projects, help the foundations, and hopefully even provide some opportunities for the individual members. So please take a look at that. Um, also, other events coming up, uh, we have the Sakai Virtual Conference in just a few days. Um, all this month, uh, uh, the Xerti Online Conference, OpenCast Virtual Summit. And then if you are in or traveling to Japan, uh, the Axis uh, conference is coming up in December. So hopefully we'll also see you at one of those. Um, and with that, I would like to welcome Karen Sandler. Uh, I have known Karen for quite a while um, and uh, she has been a, a champion of uh, software freedom, working in a variety of roles. She has a really a uh, great origin story that I hope she'll share with us of how she got involved, um, maybe not initially, but probably uh, more deeply involved with uh, free and open source software. Um, but as I said, she's the uh, executive director of the Software Freedom Conservancy, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, she has all sorts of experience uh, as a lawyer, so she brings a perspective of, of uh, both legal and copyright and intellectual property and other issues. And um, we'll talk a little bit all about that, but I'd like to thank her for being here. Um, this session is gonna be a little different than what we normally do. We're gonna do a little bit of a conversation and discussion, um, hopefully not an interview, so it doesn't sound too formal, uh, but should be a little more fun. Uh, and then just perhaps the typical slideshow. So again, thank you, Karen, for being here. And I wonder if you would just do us a, a favor and tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got involved with the free and open source um, software movement and uh, Software Freedom Conservancy. Hey, Patrick. Yeah, I'm so excited to be here. And it's exciting to see some familiar names um, in the audience and, uh, and, and also people I don't know. While we're going, feel free to put some questions into the chat, which we'll incorporate into our conversation to make sure that we're talking about the things that you're all most interested in. Um, so yeah, just to introduce myself a little bit, um, I am an engineer turned lawyer, um, turned executive director, um, I think the origin story that Patrick was hinting at in his introduction is that one of the things about me is that uh, I have an inherited heart condition. So I have, um, I literally have a big heart, which is um, somewhat hilarious, but it's called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I used to introduce it as like a very rare heart condition, but it turns out it's the most common inherited heart condition and about one in 200 people have it. And it's all fine for me. I'm um, generally without symptoms, but I'm at a very high risk of suddenly dying. Um, the medical term is sudden death. And so I have a pacemaker defibrillator that's implanted into my body in case my heart goes into a dangerous rhythm. It's generally preventative. It just sits there um, doing nothing. But in the process of like learning about 
the software on the device that I was get, getting implanted into my body. It was an incredibly fascinating experience to have this disconnect with a medical profession who did not, like the doctors and even the device technicians had not thought deeply about the software that they were implanting into people's bodies. And so I started doing research into it and discovered things that will not surprise any of you. And I think are just much more of the public zeitgeist now, which is that um, software has bugs and that this software, um, all software is vulnerable. Um, and um, and as I lived with my, um, my device, I had, situations that really drove home how important. So I, at the, when I first got my device implanted, I thought, how is it that I could be I could be someone who codes, I could have a technical background and could get software implanted into my own body, literally screwed into my heart that I can't see. How could that be even possible that I could have such little control over my own body that I can't see the software that's that's in the device implanted in it? And as I lived with the device, more and more situations happened. So when I was pregnant, my device shocked me unnecessarily, I didn't need treatment, but my heart was palpitating, which is like extremely normal for a pregnant person. Um, about a third of pregnant people have palpitations and my heart thought I was in a dangerous rhythm. And so it shocked me repeatedly. And the only way I could get it to stop reliably was to take drugs to slow my heart rate down so much so that it was hard to walk up a flight of stairs. And it was sort of like this moment of, you know what? device manufacturers do not want pregnant people getting shocked. That is like literally the last thing they want um, unnecessarily. But but my technology was not exactly designed for me. Only 15% of defibrillators go to people under the age of 65 and um, uh, less than half of them are women to, to begin with. And so despite everybody's best intentions, there was a disconnect in, um, in in how that software was designed and how it was um, was implemented, and it it's it stands for this proposition that our software may not be made for us, and what will we do about it when that happens? And so through this whole process of living with my defibrillator, then there have been more examples since then, and, and I can uh, talk about that about the problems with interoperability, but the the idea of having those unnecessary shocks, the idea of being helpless in the face of your software really made me realize how important it is that we as a public have control over our software. Like even if I like, I couldn't work with my medical professionals to do anything about the, the tweaking the software on these devices, it was just simply out of my control. And these, um, the medical device really is a metaphor for all of the critical software that we rely on. And so it ca caused me to be extremely um, passionate about making sure that we as a public are really looking after our critical software. And as I got more involved in free and open source software, I started to care a lot more about software freedom because software freedom is one of the few ways that we can ensure that people have rights with respect to the technology that impacts them. And so for me, these issues around open source are really very large questions that introduce a lot of existential societal problems and our need to advocate for control in particular, not just transparency, but control over our software is one of the most critical things. So anyway, I spoke a long time, Patrick, but I don't know that if that was, was the extent of the intro you were going for. That is, and I think it obviously highlights your commitment and why it's uh, personally important, but I think when you introduce that, it does set the context for the larger perspective around how critical software is. So whether it's medical or think of the software that's used in, in transportation or you know just everyday infrastructure that software is now, you know, cars driving around and emission standards and all sorts of things. And if you can't see that software, um, you know, you don't really know um, what's what's happening and how can you customize it to the needs of the individual. So I, it's a great starting point. So thank you. And I think. Cyborg uh, lawyer, is that um, uh, you're often introduced as a is that the term that sometimes you're? I do, as? I do. I call <laughs> myself a cyborg because it's uh, you know well. First of all, we're all in the process of becoming and unbecoming cyborgs, right? Like when we put on our glasses or we use any kind of assistive technologies, we are we are in this weird 
place of being, you know, our technology is an extension. It's enhan of us. It's enhancing us, and we rely on it in new ways every single day. And thinking of it in terms of like cyborg status is for me it's it's sort of like because it's it's talking about the evolution of humanity and the like the ways in which technology is so fundamental to who we are now but also it's i think of it as very positive so it's sort of like it's it's also aspirational how can we incorporate technology into our lives and society in ways that benefit us but it's also like these questions of identity that um that no you know we we can't just pretend that software is just some you know, akin to some random tool anymore. We have to realize that not only are we so reliant on technology, not only are we incorporating it in new ways, but we're impacted by technology all around us, whether we choose to be a user of that software or not. And I think that touches, well, I have some questions later on, but I think that touches exactly on some of the topics that our audience or our community in higher education will be very interested in, is that interface and in teaching and learning where technology is no longer just delivering um, content and, and, you know, enabling different types of collaboration through courses and, and so on. But often now it's, it's interpreting and even and determining the type of education, the pedagogy that might be applied or the teaching and learning materials that are generated in order to teach some discipline or, or deliver some content. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but just um, again, for those who may not uh, be familiar with Software Freedom Conservancy, can you tell us a little bit about uh, that organization and what your focus is on and, and, and some initiatives that, you're, that you all are uh, up to? Yeah, definitely. So Software Freedom Conservancy, I'm a co-founder of it, and it's basically focused on all of the ethical parts of software. Um, and uh, and what that generally translates to is three major branches of our work. Um, I say like as an overarching philosophy, we are looking for our, our aspirations are large, our, our principles are sweeping, but as an organization, we've always looked for concrete activities that move the needle to help um, improve the situation for software freedom. And so we have three major branches of the work that we do. And our logo is a tree. So I love that like we've got three branches. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, so one of our branches is fiscal sponsorship and fiscal sponsorship. Um, you know, we have many critical software projects, things that everybody's heard of, uh, like Git or Inkscape or things you might have used. Uh, reproducible builds is an another, um, uh, you know, another of our projects. And we've got um, uh, uh, dozens of those and we are their nonprofit home. And so we do quite a lot of work to help um, forward those projects. In general, our projects, uh, we used to be like a general fiscal sponsor and we've uh, we've really tailored that in the last um, uh, few years that we're really a fiscal sponsor for projects that are advancing the cause of software freedom in some um, uh, appreciable way. And then the, um, the second branch that we have is, um, is diversity and inclusion and the idea is that um, just like i was uh i was uh shocked by technology that wasn't exactly made for me our technology will never be made for everyone if it's not made by everyone and so uh we do an internship program where we do paid remote internships for folks subject to systemic bias and we're impacted by underrepresentation. and we have two programs for that one is called outreachy where we do um internships um, and again the eligibility is not for any group per se but it's paid remote internships for anyone who can tell us about the discrimination that they've experienced. Um, and that's for anyone 18 or older. Folks could be um, you know, university students, but they don't have to be. And then the second program is um, uh, Institute for Computing and Research, um, and that is a high school internship program where we do in three different cities. And, um, and that's pretty, pretty fun, too, where um, uh, students you know, we generally target less privileged schools where students in those schools are able to um, sign up for this internship program and learn the basic skills that they would need for an internship at a scientific institution that are often basically wow. only go to the kids of people who are already scientists and who already have knowledge. Um, so they learn about scientific computing and that's really fun. 
And wow. then uh, the last piece of our work, the third branch is, um, is, is focused around copy left and copy left. A lot of the names here are people who I know know what copy left <laughs> is, but I'll just do a really quick introduction to it for people who I don't know or people who are listening to the recording, which is that copy left is a form of licensing that uses copyright, but for sharing instead of creating sort of a traditional copyright monopoly. And the idea is that it's a sort of reciprocal licensing that says, you can do whatever you want with this copyrighted material or you know software um, for example um, but if you use this material under this license and you distribute the software or make changes and distribute your changes you can use it for whatever you want but you have to do so under the same license and it's this amazing growing body of forever free software that has been created. Um, the Linux kernel is an example of a very widely used project that's under copyleft. And copyleft is one of the licenses that directly, copyleft licensing is one of the licensing mechanisms that directly gives people rights with software rights with respect to their software. Um, and so we have this, uh, we have quite a lot to both increase education about copyleft because it's uh, so beneficial. Um, uh, and then secondly, to help defend the uses of copyleft that are already in existence, there's a tremendous amount of copylefted code already out there. But when companies use that software and don't follow the rules and don't share their code like they're supposed to, it basically degrades the software rights that people have. And so, um, and so we stand up for those licenses and we've, um, we've been involved in the courts. We sued a company called Vizio in the United States, a large television manufacturer, um, as a user's rights, as a consumer rights lawsuit. And we have other actions sort of in that regard too. So, and we're very interested in all of the major issues of the day and how they affect the, like the ethics of our technology. So uh, for example, we've been really involved with the copyrights office request for um, feedback about um, so-called artificial intelligence or, or assistive, uh, you know, LLM uh, generative technology and, and things like that. And so we're sort of, we have our, our fingers in, in a lot of, we're a tiny organization. So it, it sounds like we're big from that. <laughs> it's amazing how much work you all are doing considering, um, you know, exactly the, the tiny, but influential organization, but a broad scope of practice. And I, I think that the, those, um, three branches and maybe a fourth, um, I guess highlight the different perspectives of that I'd like to talk about and ask you about. Um, there's the fiscal sponsorship work you do, so the project orientation um, and that perspective. There's what you're doing to to help raise awareness, adoption, authentic, authenticity within the free and open source software movement, whether that's through working with um, you know building community for uh, uh, you know underrepresented folks or lawsuits to, for around copy left and so on. So there's that community building broadly as an ecosystem. Um, and then there's also, of course, the foundation, you, you, know, you just mentioned, it's a small group doing a lot of work, that perspective of how do you build that community. So um, from that perspective, I wonder if you, you know, from that experience, what practices um, do you find are most effective in helping projects, the community, and even conservancy itself, you know, where do those entwine? Where are those separate, but important that they're uh, delivered, you know, just maybe some starting from big picture of, of the principles and practices that the conservancy uses to help those projects helps the community and indeed help itself. Because if you're not able to sustain yourself, we hear a lot about project sustainability. And of course, Aperio has that uh, same fiscal sponsorship role. So we're definitely uh, interested in helping our projects maintain the projects and become sustainable and so on. But of course, we also, as a foundation, are worried about our own sustainability. And we have to have a uh, active and engaged and um, community uh, for both of those different parts, the projects and the foundation to survive. So maybe talk a little bit about some of the things that you're doing, why you're doing them, some best practices, some challenges, some don't do's, I don't know, whatever you think uh, uh, might be uh, relevant here. Oh gosh, it's such a big question, Patrick. That's yeah. basically, we could totally use the rest of the time talking about teasing that out and all the different pieces of it. But I would firstly say that everybody here should be 
really doing everything we can to help Aperio because currently all the fiscal sponsors are in, they're in peril. We're all in peril. Um, Open Collective Foundation announced that, which is the C3 part of Open Collective, so not the whole platform, but announced that they uh, or, or have shut, or are in the process of shutting down and they uh, their project sought to find other homes. And it's because, and, it's because it's so hard to raise money to keep this kind of organization sustainable. And Open Collective Foundation had $50 million of throughput in the two years that it was around. And so it's sort of like, if they can't do it, you know, with with 50 million, how are we supposed to do it? Um, and it's and, and, and it's complicated, right? I mean, I think the answers are, this is all intertwined with what you're talking about in the rest of the question, which is that a, a large part about making these organizations sustainable is really having clear principles about why you're doing what you're doing, communicating those principles and sticking with it. Um, I think that the ideology behind Software Freedom Conservancy is one of the things that really motivates our donors and motivates our community to kind of contribute back and help keep us going. And I think associated with that is a lot of transparency and a lot of respect for our community, having a lot of discussions with folks that are, um, you know, care deeply about our um, our cause and and trying to engage them in ways where they feel like they have some degree of agency so that we're like, you know, we're fighting their fight, um, but we are not some group of people that magically is ordained to do that. We, um, we are in the service of the community and we serve at the pleasure of the community. And so, um, you know, we think we know what we should be working on in order to tackle these really complex issues. But at the end of the day, you know, it's the public that decides whether they think the work we do is valuable and will contribute back to us. And this fundraising situation is really dire right now. Um, uh, lots of individuals are, you know, individual giving is down, corporate giving, especially in open source is down. And there's so much pressure on grant making that Grants are, uh, you know, are are some of them have, that have been in this space have um, have dried up, or some of them um, are, uh, have switched program areas to some hot topics like the right. generative Definitely. AI space. Exactly. <laughs> so you know, I think that the the funding situation is really really tough mm -hmm. uh, overall, but the thing that always gets us back to, and it has, and it has been, it's gotten tougher recently, but it's always, always has been. And the thing that gets us back around is this ideological component of it. And I think that that's, you know, we've had like 10, 15 years of people talking about support maintainers. Like we need to make sure the maintainers, every single, every single talk you will go to, you will see that XKCD comic with the, like, there's like the the complicated Guilty. structure with the little yes support um, which is somebody living in their parents basement in Nebraska I think was the is the the little label on it and um, and I, I I think that supporting uh, <laughs> um, laughing at what uh, Gay said in the that, comments yeah. That yeah. they're in Nebraska but that's not them in the picture um, so uh, yeah so the and I, I think that's really important because there is a lot of unappreciated um, open source maintainership, but I would say that the emphasis that we had on paying maintainers was really important, but it was only a piece of the story because such a huge portion of the software that we rely on, that's this critical infrastructure that's at the basis of a lot of the work that we do is, is copy left at software and much of it was, um, was created by people who were passionate about the cause of software freedom and the idea of doing things differently. A lot of it was motivated by people who were students or academics who were like just super jazzed about this idea that we could create this whole knowledge base and do things differently than we had done it before. And that in fact, this common thread of initiative based on excitement around an idea of doing things better for the world is part of what has made the entire copy left and software freedom movement possible to, to date. And I think that that's something that we can never lose sight of. And it's one of the things that Software Freedom Conservancy is really focused on. And that's why we do like 
listening sessions and Q and A's and um, try to write as much as we can and try to be accessible and come to conferences and um, and do conversations right. like this. How how well do you think the general end user adopter community understands the depth of services and and activities that are involved in maintaining a free or an open source project so yes there's like you said 10 15 years of maintain the maintainer um that which again is important um there are also a lot of other activities that happen that perhaps you know, in our case, a university might not appreciate, um, they can see the software. And so they, of course, there must be somebody who's writing that software, but all the other activities that have to happen in order for that project to become sustainable. How well do you think um, the end user adopters understand and appreciate that and therefore are willing to support it in some way? And how well do you think organizations like Aperio or Conservancy. How well do how well are we doing in communicating the breadth of services and the scope of practice that needs to happen in order to keep a project going? Oh, such big questions again. I mean, I think that <laughs> <laughs> you answer it. I'm giving you, um, I'm giving you lots of room to uh, discuss. Just put it out there. But I think it was building on what you said. You know, we've been focusing on maintain the maintainer, and people see software as free as in no cost. So they're just like, oh, we can just use this. And yes, I guess even if I give a little, I guess I'm supporting that person or those people, but there's a whole infrastructure behind that. And are they aware of that? And how how are we as nonprofit foundations supporting free and open source software doing in making that case? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I sorry about that. That's odd. So I just, I answered your question for you so we can move on. No, I'm kidding. Great. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> Um, um yeah i mean i i i think that like the um uh actually what 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 did you say while i was gone just away so i was asking how well nonprofit foundations and organizations that are supporting projects and in fact the projects themselves are um explaining making the case for the broader scope of services and and that are required beyond code development that make a project sustainable um, to the end user adopter community. And you said that we're all doing a great job while I was gone. <laughs> I, I think I think the good news is is that people understand the role of software a lot better than they used to. Like I think that even as recently as five six years ago, if you had like referred to open source, people would not really they would have heard of it, but they wouldn't really know what you meant. And I think also the idea of like how essential software is to the things that they did, they would probably not. Um, they probably just would have. I, I remember people would generally just like kind of roll their eyes at you. They would sort of be like, "Why? Why should I care about the software that I use?" And now I think it's a completely different situation. And most importantly, I think young people really get the. They really understand the influence that big tech generally has on their lives, and they're quite skeptical of it in a way that's different from, you know, as I said, like as recently as five years ago. I mean, you know. There are uh, high school students in my neighborhood who don't have phones, like who uh, who eschew a lot of the traditional social media and other uses of technology that have come before. And they're just, you know, there's a, a whole movement uh, here, but it's not, um, you know, it's not nationwide and it's nascent. But what I have seen is that especially university students are really waking up to these problems. I mean, um, Last year, I was awarded an honorary doctorate, which was really fun and exciting. But the really, the, but but the, but the exciting part about it was that it's uh, it was from Kai Leuven, which is a sixty thousand um, student university, and I was nominated by the student body. And where wow. you could have like they could have nominated Taylor Swift, <laughs> so, like, you know. And I just sort of feel like like and what I'm and, and I'm not that well known, and so it's interesting because there was obviously a group of active software freedom, you know, advocates in the um, in the student body. But it just really stands for the fact that 
students are really waking up to these issues. They're when presented in the right way, and this is where you know um, academics play such an important role. I think that it, it's a it's a whole different experience. And so I think that you know, I think the public at large understands that there's an issue, but they're often misplaced about what they what the solutions might be. So like uh, what we went through with legislation around TikTok in the United States, for example, um, as well as many other examples, sort of demonstrate how people know there's a problem, but they don't really know quite what the answers are. And software freedom is an important piece of the solution. It's not the whole solution, but it's an important piece of it. And I think that we as organizations in the space have been getting better over the last few years to try to explain what we do and why it's important. And I think that message is starting to land in a way that it hasn't before. Are you finding that too, Patrick? Yeah, I, I think what you're saying is, is really interesting in the fact that the work that you're doing in advocacy or awareness opens the door for the adoption of the of tools or the technology. There's this you know, it's sort of what comes first. Do people discover open source software and its value potential, you know, proposition and then go and find them, or do they find a project and then see the value of that and then get engaged? Um, I don't think anyone just immediately one day decides, well, maybe I'm sure somebody has just says, hey, I'm going to start an open source project for no reason, just because it sounds like a cool thing. There's some driver behind it. And I'm always curious what that driver is and then what motivated it. Was it that they were a student and they saw you on stage getting your honorary doctorate and they said, oh, let me look into this. And then they grew in it to that way. Was it that they, it's the classic sort of, I just need this tool, so I'll build it and hopefully somebody else can use it. And that's sort of, that's what everyone thinks. But I think there's so many different avenues into free and open source software. And for, in my roles, working in organizations that are promoting the adoption and development of open source software. It's always been a challenge to find what's the message that resonates with people when the, people are on so many different paths into open source. Um, so we, I've always struggled with that. And I'm always curious that other people share that. And I, cause I'm looking for the person that says, no, you just add water and you know, but it grows. So, I'm always curious to hear what other organizations are doing and whether that sounds familiar. Um, and so that's why I was asking, what are those considering conservancy's broad scope of practice? It must be a multiplier because you're dealing with the, the projects and their perspectives. You're also dealing with the you know, government regulation and legal issues and so on. And how do people get into that part of your work? Um, I don't know if that makes sense in my perspective, but that's, I don't know. Do you, do you feel that as well? That unsure of how to best engage with folks? Oh, de Find definitely. Where they are? I mean, the issues are complicated, you know, like they're complicated and to try to simplify it in a way that is a powerful resonant message is to gloss over very important details about how things work. And if you want to have intellectual honesty about the problems and about any kind of solution so that they could be helpful and practical, you have to dive into details that then will lose a large segment of people. Exactly. And so I, I, I think it's incredibly challenging. And, um, and and the only way to handle it is to just really treat people as the intelligent people that they are who have a great capacity to understand complexity. And it's interesting because our national and even global politics um, are such that difficult to bring complexity or nuance to any, <laughs> any question or any discussion, but we, mu we, we must continue to do that because it's the only way we can create solutions that will ever have any traction that can ever actually work. And software freedom is one of those particular situations. We're so burdened by what has come before us in terms of the personalities that we're advocating for it. Um, the like, I'd say like the core of like software freedom activists in the past relied on a level of advocacy that included making people feel bad about choosing proprietary software when they felt like they didn't have a better choice. And I, I you know, and that's been really difficult to overcome because 
we must make better choices when we can. I want to applaud you all because this is one of the few forums that I've been invited to speak on that is Big Blue Button, that is a free and open system <laughs> where we're talking about open things in an open space and I, I think and it's hard to do that but it's worth the effort because it means that we are ourselves buying into the infrastructure that we need to be able to solve these complicated problems so i but i hear you patrick i totally agree like people come to this issue from a whole different set of ways and we need to find ways to get people to um, understand us so what's interesting for us at software freedom conservancy is that the ways that people hear about us are so odd because we basically like we try to talk to the world, we try we bring cases like our Visio case that we think will have some more resonance in the general public. But ultimately, do you know several people came to me because they heard about SFC from Chat GPT? Oh, really? Yeah. Like, apparently, I got this you amazing have a quote? message. I have an amazing message from somebody who um, who left us a message on the Software Freedom Conservancy voicemail box, and it's. <laughs> said, hi, y'all, I don't know who you are or what you do, but I asked ChatGPT what nonprofit I should donate to. And at oh, first, wow. ChatGPT didn't, didn't want to tell me who to donate to, but I pushed and pushed. And eventually, ChatGPT said to donate to Software Freedom Conservancy. And again, I don't know who you all are, but ChatGPT told me to donate to you, so I gave you ten dollars. Keep on keeping on, and like that was literally the message. <laughs> and I, I was flummoxed by that, and I was like, "What? How? How? How could that? How could that have happened?" I <laughs> like think that's a we are like such an unknown small organization. We're scrappy, and I realized it's because the huge body of training materials for this for many of these generative AI models are on like are, are on right. copy lefted materials and created by people. A lot of the conversational things are people who believe strongly in copy left. And so, you know, and so this is, it's, it's a dark realization because there's the realization of like, oh, actually there's all this copy lefted material that's being washed through these generative AI systems and put out on the other end without any copywriting at all, which is dark, but on the upside, it's possibly introducing some bias of I was like just towards say. sharing and <laughs> towards is this is the first time ideas. I've had a positive first time I've had a positive uh, AI bias story. So uh, yeah, I guess it's not all that. But I, don't I think know. this is I mean, interesting. interesting. Talking about that call in your sustainers program. So for friends of Aperio, we we talk about you know benefits for individuals who might want to see the, the projects that are contributed, contributing to, you know, keep going and they're supporting that. It might be for institutional, you know, faculty or instructional designers, or someone on a campus who want to see the project continue or the foundation continue to provide support. Um, you know, so there's all these different perspectives coming in, like we we're talking about before. And this person who discovered you through ChatGPT, you know, maybe talk a little about your sustainers program. And by the way, I'm a sustainer and everyone should also join um, I, for many years that as you're hearing uh, Conservancy does amazing work, but my motivations are, I don't, well, I use many, I use Inkscape and BusyBox and things like that, but um, so I am a user, but my motivation is really to keep the foundation going for the broader work, not just the fiscal sponsorship, but also the important work that you're doing around software freedom and protecting copy life and opening up opportunities for everyone to participate. It's all those sort of policy angles. How do you, what's your approach to your sustainers um, program um, to one, share all that information? Obviously you're relying on, relying on chat GPT to get your word out now, which is great marketing <laughs> on your part. I don't know how you did that, but what's your approach there? And, and what's your thinking when you were creating the program um, so that it's not just a charity, uh, but it's a it's an investment that people realize through giving. Yeah, you know, I, this is our we're really scratching our heads over it. We launched it um, around nine years ago, our sustainer program, um, and it has literally. I mean, we were more corporate uh, funded back back when I joined as executive director, uh, which is now a decade ago, um, and then. Uh, 
launching the sustainer program was our way of basically saving our organization because we were too uh, beholden to what our um, our corporate sponsors were saying, and it didn't match what we felt was the most critical, important, publicly facing work. And so we were finally at a crossroads where we're, our, our corporate sponsors were saying, if you don't do things differently, we're going to pull our funding. And we were looking at it and saying, well, you know, this is the work we're really supposed to be doing based on our mission. We can't be responsive to corporate interests. And so we launched our sustainer program. Um, and luckily that saved us at the time. I would say things are, um, are, are bleak again, as I said before. And there are some questions that were already in, um, in the channel here that we should come back to um, because I think they were really interesting uh, and comments, but, um, but we've we're, we've got the problem of that we're such a small org that it takes all of our people to do the work so you know organizations like i'm just said not i'm not picking on anybody but just like say the eff because they're an amazing organization and they do amazing work they have you know over 100 employees and they have i think it was like 25 people that are on staff who are <sighs> their sole job is to talk about the work they do which is incredibly important right that advocacy that explaining the the work um you know artists designers all of that stuff is incredibly important the talking about the work is is such a big part of the work itself but we only have eight people so our people are constantly you know, we're, we're working flat out just to do the work, let alone talk about it. And so I think that's the biggest challenge that we have. But the nice thing about making the sustainers program is that our incentives are aligned with the public incentives. So we are really incentivized to do work that we're going to be able to talk about that people will get excited about. And then, um, and I think that for us as a small org, that's been the hardest challenge about maintaining our sustainer program is that we've done, we did, we did this, we, we, um, we've done like, um, regulatory actions to, um, to help ensure right to repair with respect to software that we just haven't even had time to get our blog post up about. And it was like two months ago. So right. that's, I think, the biggest challenge, but uh, but also really exciting because people care what we do and they're really invested and we're so incentivized to um, to talk about it. I think um, Neil said in the channel that it's shocking to hear that Open Collective is having problems and that open source maybe needs to consider its financial models more diligently. Um, and then um, Derek said that I wonder if we need to be looking at the term enclosure to help us understand the position that um, many find itself in freedom has vanished and i think it's it's really interesting it's not just open it's not really open collective the platform that's had the financial issue it was the open collective foundation that had 50 million dollars worth of, um, of projects of the c3 side of it and uh and I, I think that this is a this is happening across the board and diversity initiatives are being hit even harder so um, women who code announced that they went out of business and girls in tech said, if we don't get a hundred thousand dollars, we're going to have to shut down. And you know, they didn't get a hundred thousand dollars. And so they shut down. It's like, it's, it's just so sad that these tried and true organizations and we're finding it with outreach. If we didn't have a big reserve, that program would already be shut down as well. So, um, uh, it's so tough. Our, it's tough. Yeah. How are you approach? How's Conservancy approaching this? I mean, um, I mean, it totally resonates with me that you know, the, how many people do you need to just communicate what you're up to, and then the the value of that, so that folks understand that the work that the organization is doing is important and relevant. And then, how do you? How are you? You don't want to chase the next hot topic and just only pay attention sort of to the things that are grabbing press in order to you know make folks think you're relevant or something you know you have to stay on mission and and um you know work on those things even when they might not be the most you know headline grabbing topics i mean have you thought about um like you were saying the sort of impact that uh corporate sponsorship is decreasing its its giving and there might be strings attached uh, um, and when you have a, a community that maybe doesn't appreciate all of the things that the organization has to do, and that's not just about code development, um, what are some of the strategies that you're looking at or Conservancy is looking at now to address those 
issues that are coming in now around financial stability. Yeah, it's and so even, interesting. Yeah, go ahead. Well, no, I was going. That's, that's. I didn't want to give you another big question. So that was big enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, it's. I don't know. I mean, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a real optimist that things will, uh, will turn around and, uh, and, uh, and be positive. I'm pleased to hear that uh, Derek is saying in the channel that, uh, weirdly, folks are now seeing a resurgence in interest in open education, um, especially in multilingual contexts. Um, so I, I think that's really exciting to hear, um, to hear about. I, I don't I don't really um, you know I, I found that you can think short term and um, and try to do things that are splashy um, to get attention and you can try to satisfy corporate donors and their strings but uh, but none of those solve any of the long term interests and you have to stay long term focused in order to be able to keep that work going and to be effective because even if you do something splashy today at the expense of something that's handling the less sensational work that is essential for the long term you'll only save yourselves for the next six months um, and really we need to focus long term software freedom is a cause that's long term it's a cause that's in the service of other social justice issues and so we need to think long term and the way I think of it for a software freedom conservancy is we just do the good work and if people see how valuable it is they'll support it and if it means that we have to shut down as an org because we can't get funding well you know we did it doing the right things it means that we've we were good stewards of the funds that were donated to us and we use them in the ways that we thought with public collaboration and input were the right ways to spend it and that's all that we can do. That's all that any of these organizations can do. And I think that the, right. um, I forget who said it above who I read that comment before about um, the problems that um, that open source has, but it's true that we don't, we have more, there's more open source than ever before, but there's less software freedom. We have so much less control over our critical technology now than we ever did before. The ordinary person has almost no ability to even customize, let alone control the software that they rely on. And it's something that will, will ultimately have to come to a head because as corporations continue to pivot away from the business models that they sold to their customers, it becomes much more evident that this is happening. And in very critical um, technological service platforms um, in the last two years, as they've pivoted away from being VC funded for their initial splashes, we're seeing that more and more. And so I think that these issues are, it, 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 I, think it's, I think it's hard. I think it's gonna get harder before it gets easier. I think it's gonna get worse before it gets better. And all we can do is, um, is really focus on our principles and doing the work that we think that will move the needle. And again, everybody in the education space is such an important piece of this puzzle because we would not have any of the critical infrastructure that we have now were it not for well-placed professors and other people involved in academia who have carried this message of software freedom to students in particular, but, um, but to others in, 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 in academic programs. And I, I, I cannot understate the importance that that has had um, in, um, in the course of our technology generally. And I think that now is such a critical time to bring this message to students and to like create this new wave while there's a hunger for a new model of getting things done. I feel like for the first time in a decade, there's so much optimism and possibility. And I think that like, I, I, and, and I, I think that young people and students are a huge part of, part of that story. Yeah, and I, I agree. I think um, and Derek's comment about the resurgence of OER um, in the long term, that the resurgence, having a long-term perspective that you're talking about um, is definitely, we're seeing it. Uh, we were just at Educause uh, last month and presenting on the engagement of with open source and universities is dropping, but the adoption is increasing. Um, so having that long term to you know maybe let the organizations we work with catch up. Um, and I think one of the long term things that you all are doing um, is FOSSI. I mean, I think there that is a event that is not just filling a gap, but 
humbly, in my own opinion, perhaps reorienting from prior events that uh, on the West Coast that might have not had that same uh, uh, motivation for the event. Um, maybe talk a little bit about what FOSSI is uh, real quick um, and what your long-term goals are there, why you started it up, um, what you hope to achieve with the, with the conference. Yes. Oh, we only have a few minutes left, I think. But uh -huh. uh, but yeah, FOSSI, it's a it's community led tracks. So it's a conference that if you've ever been to the conference FOSDEM, it's inspired by some of the models for how that was organized. Um, the idea is that folks in the community can come like a Perio and propose tracks um, that we have at our bigger conference. And so we have this um, education track, um, uh, which has been really amazing for the last two years. Uh, the conference is only two years old and so we're going to be in portland oregon um july 31st to august 3rd um and uh it's been amazing because it's really the only north american conference that's not regional that is um is trying this approach and uh, really focused on software freedom so i'm very excited about it we already have some we opened our track proposals early this year and we already have a couple of submissions um, and I think it's going to be really great. What I love about it is that the like the folks that come to it at least so far have been just an amazing group of people who really know a lot about the issues and want to really dig in and engage in some of the kinds of conversations that I haven't had anywhere else. So I, 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 I'm the organizer so I'm supposed to say it but I've had <laughs> such a delightful time but Stephanie has said so in the comments here so yes. uh, it's totally legit uh, but yes. no I really find that it's such a a great place to um, to come and talk about issues around open source so definitely um, plan on coming to that if you um, if you're open to coming to uh, Portland Oregon in July well the end of July this is July 31st to August uh, what did I say third or fourth <laughs> and for a pair it's great I mean we've done the education track so thank you it's been a great opportunity uh, for us uh, to promote software freedom and open source in in higher ed well what I think it's great about it and what I'm personally hoping to, that we can do is is bring all the education folks together who all know each other in, in open source and then introduce the broader community um, and and create that network where we have education folks working with in the open source community and then the open source community working with education folks because I think it's easy for I think Aperio to get as an organization, the projects do a great job because they're out on the campuses. They're dealing directly with the institutions and the folks hands on. But I think it's easy for Aperio to become just focused perhaps on higher education and not take advantage of all the wealth of knowledge and, and experience and activity that's happening in the broader free and open source software communities, um, which is really some of the motivation behind these micro conferences. Um, and so that FOSSI has been a great platform for a pair to expand its its community and, and network and and learn so much from and it's just amazing people come back the projects come back the individuals that go come back all excited and rejuvenated it's sort of a battery charge for for everyone so i'm very uh excited that it's happening and and excited for next year and, and the pair will definitely be submitting an, a phosphor education uh track again oh i'm so um, glad to hear it because it was really such a great track uh, well, that is the top of the hour, I think. Uh, yeah, I didn't even get to my other slides because we just kept going on uh, different topics, but we we hit a lot of the things. And Karen, I want to thank you so much uh, for chatting with me. Um, it was great. Uh, it, it, this was a battery charge for me. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's always great to see what other folks are doing, maybe commiserate a little bit to, to, to feel like, okay, we're all sort of in the same boat, but then you know, look at the others around who are doing good work and Conservancy is definitely doing the good work. Um, so thank you again so much for not only today, but all the work that you're doing to promote software freedom, uh, open source software um, and communities of practice that support it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick and everybody else. I'm really jazzed about the work that everybody is doing and I loved connecting with all of you. Um, all right. Well, thanks everyone. Um, next month, uh, we're actually having uh, uh, another our last of the year um, and it's uh, I should have a slide for this but it's all I want to click through all of them but we'll be sending out more information about the next micro conference and uh, we hope you'll join us then and thanks again to everyone for joining us today bye-bye